Welcome to another episode of Homegrown the Series. I'm your host, Emmanuel Davis. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with a survivor, a creator. She's known by many, so I'm going to introduce her to some of you guys, but I'm pretty sure you know who this person is. She has created her own community of followers. If you have ever seen hashtag Sid, Sid Strong and didn't know who it was about, it is about Sydney Kennedy. Sydney, welcome to Homegrown Series. Mm, I really like that intro. That was that was really good. Thank you. <laughs> you know? I mean, I got notes, but that was that was a that was top, it sounded very genuine. It is very genuine. And let's just get straight to it. The love that people show you on social media or just like in real life is genuine. Whenever you post something about um the cancer that you got diagnosed with in 2009, people are inspired by that. So my first question is, when you first got that diagnosis, how do you feel? How did you feel? Um, I mean, obviously super upset, sad, crying. I was really, I mean, I've never even heard of the disease. Like my, the name of my cancer is called Ewing sarcoma. So I didn't know anything about it. So I was pretty like scared of just like the whole process and like what I had to do from the diagnosis on. They immediately started talking about surgery and chemo. And I've only known people who are much older than me to be diagnosed with cancer. I didn't know anyone with my age that had cancer. Even when I was younger, I didn't know anybody who was sick when it was like a kid. So that was just so strange to me. So I was, you know, 19, scared. I was down to U of I, U of I and, um, Champagne. So I didn't want to leave my friends. I was felt like I was just getting my foot in, you know, mm-hmm. down at school. I was in a new major, you know, making new friends. And they just had, they literally, my dad came down to my school and said, pack your stuff. Like I came home <clears throat> that, that we, the weekend before I was there for Easter. So mm-hmm. like I went back to school that Sunday and I kept saying like, you know, my side really hurts. I can't, you know, be in the car with like three people in the back seat, like how we used to do back and forth to college, everybody piled in the car. So uh, one of my friends was like, okay, you can ride with me, you can sit in the front seat, we'll be good. And then I got a scan maybe like that past Friday. So then uh, I went back that Sunday and Monday my dad called said, it's an emergency, I'm on my way get most of your clothes so i left a lot of my clothes because i was like no i'm not going to bring anything because i want to come back down to school Mm. and i hadn't been that was like my last day at that school from that semester until like the next two semesters in terms of going to school there because i took i had to take off from that april until the following um, january so i was off just for one full semester so I was going back and forth, like visiting, but that was it. Never saw that dorm room again. <laughs> okay. So when did it hit you that this is real and that it's going to change your life? Um, so when he first picked me up, he didn't really say, you know, they said, you know, the, doctors to have to, the doctors need to talk to us. It's like an emergency, something went wrong with your scan or they did an x-ray initially so the x-ray showed um some type of activity and then i had to go down and do all of these scans all of these doctors visits so it kind of hit home immediately i mean i didn't i was very confused you know it hit kind of immediately just because they started talking about surgery pretty fast like i might have got surgery the next week wow and then i got chemo from like they started it while I was in the hospital recovering mm-hmm. from the surgery. So everything was really fast. They, I didn't really have time to sit down and say, cancer, like, what is that? Like, what's Ewing sarcoma? I didn't know anything about it. So how did you move on going back to college, picking back up with your friends? Did life return to any kind of normalcy? And while I was in college? Yes. It did. Um, that whole semester I kept visiting. I mean, luckily I went to U of I, so it was only like an hour and a half, two hours away. So I visited mm-hmm. a lot, 
was drinking when I wasn't supposed to, you know. Y'all didn't cheat and say my, that. Just in moderation. Mm -hmm. They weren't really like trying to let me drink and trying to let me touch anything. And then I had two roommates. So like I had to find somebody to sublet my room. And that became a whole thing too. So it returned to normalcy once I was able to come back down to U of I and I moved in. And then I kind of just started back where I picked started back where I um, left off and I started taking more classes than I should have because my mm -hmm. EPA pretty much took a hit when I left because they still they said okay you don't have to give us your work back tomorrow but you do have to because it happened right before finals so I did have to do my final project so I got C's and B minuses on mostly everything so it brought my GPA down yeah and then when I came back to school I took like you know six courses Usually I was only taking like four or five because I wanted to really graduate with my friends. Mm -hmm. I was going hard. I was, going, I was doing too much. And my GPA showed that I was playing too much. But you finished. I did. You finished. Cross the so shape. The, the next floor, congratulations on that. Um, mm -hmm. We sometimes hear about when people get that phone call saying that they have cancer or any kind of sickness that it changes their life for the worse. Yeah. But you turn your situation into something for the better. So my question is, when I see hashtag Sid Strong, what motivates you? What does Sid Strong mean? Um, I would say it's not that it changed my life. I wouldn't, I guess, word it that it made it better. I would just say I made the best of it. Okay. Um, and see as strong is really just like my supporters, people that like support me, you know, are behind me, people that come to visit, send me calls right on my wall. Like if I post something on Facebook, like I'll get all of like my mom's friends in the comments. And I don't mm -hmm. even know how see as strong like came about. I think like somebody just like an old friend of mine might have posted it, like see a strong under a picture. Then mm. everybody started saying see a strong. So like when I see people say see a strong, it really means a lot just because I know it's coming from like a place of love. And it's really like my friends, my family, people that might follow me on Instagram or, you know, like some of my old high school friends from on Facebook. Like when I see see a strong, it's really coming from them and coming from people that, you know, want to see the best for me. Okay. Okay. Well, why do you feel like sharing your story is important to people who may be doing, dealing with something similar to your situation? It's important because, you know, I'm 31 now, young, Black. I'm, for me, it's important to see somebody that looks like me who might be going through the same thing. And that's not always something I saw. Even like on movies, when you see movies, it's always like, if they're black, they're much older mm -hmm. and they're somebody, someone's mom or grandma who's like struggling with cancer. And it's always the same sort of cancer. It's always mm -hmm. breast cancer. It's, you know, maybe a brain tumor here and there, but, you know, you've never really heard people with different sarcomas. And maybe more so recently, I might hear somebody who has osteosarcoma, but that's also usually in a guy that mm -hmm. I might see it with. Or... Um, on the movies and TV, it's like, you know, like a, a white woman or a young white girl who fell in love with someone in the cancer clinic or the cancer unit. So it's different to see somebody that's, you know, that's black and that's, you know, around your same age who's dealing with the same cancer. Or not even necessarily just black, but just somebody that has still out here, you know, having fun and not always in the hospital or not just always like in my room. Like people just have that preconceived notion that once you have cancer, you're always sick, you're always tired, you're always throwing up. And, you know, for me, it was like that sort of, and during the beginning, but I still didn't let it keep me in the house. Like I'm a busybody, I like to move around. So people see- Excellent segue. <laughs> so people see me, um, doing those sort of things. So I think it's just important for anybody to see, you know, my story, even if it's not them dealing with cancer. Like I get people DMing me and say like they're helping somebody deal with cancer or they're dealing with depression or dealing with anxiety and they saw my story and they're like, I mean, you're out here doing, you know, more than what I'm doing or you're doing mm -hmm. your thing. So 
I get people who respond to me like that a lot. So I think it's important to just continue sharing it so that more people will know. And then it does share uh, or spread awareness for um, just people with cancer and just like standing on top of your health and going to the doctor and just me going to my doctor's visits. And, you know, like you said, it's not a death sentence all the time. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, But speaking of your story, if you know you, if you follow you on Instagram, if you follow any of your social media pages, you like food and film. And we're in the midst of a pandemic now. So festivals have been taken away. Movie theaters have been closed. So it's a good time to either learn how to cook or binge watch TV. So have you tweaked those cooking skills or just started binge watching more television? At the beginning, I was tweaking the cooking skills a little bit more. I was cooking more. And I'm not going to lie, I got tired of washing dishes. Facts. So annoying. It was just every day, another dish, another food recipe. So I kind of, I definitely fell back from the cooking. I definitely don't cook as much as I was towards the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, Film-wise, TV-wise, did I watch anything new? Uh, Lovecraft. I watched Lovecraft Country. That's like the newest show that I watched. Um, Can I I interject real quick? Yeah. How do you describe Lovecraft Country? Mm. I would say it's a sci-fi fantasy drama. Okay. Not horror, not thriller-ish. Because I... mm, Because it's not like traditional horror and it does have the sci-fi and more of a fantasy with just like the monsters and, mm-hmm. you know, well, the nine tails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The lady with the nine tails. I feel like that falls yeah. into more of like a sci-fi fantasy. And then it does have drama because it's set in like, I don't know what year it's set in. The 40s, 50s, 40s, 60s 50s. in Chicago. <laughs> you, I think everybody's saying that same thing. The 40s, 50s, 50s 60s. 60s. Those are like 40s, 50s, very three specific. But in the future. Things. In Chicago, right in this, I, right, so it's like a timepiece at the end of the yeah. day. So they do have like a drama of like what's actually really going on during that time and why people didn't like us much. I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> still do, but back then it really didn't. So yeah. it was, you know, showing that. I, I like that they touched on Emmett Hill. Mm-hmm. That was uh, a powerful episode. Yeah, that was really, yeah really powerful um they touched on a lot of different things that's you know important to us in history mm-hmm. but it's also at the end of the episode we saw monsters we saw her become a white woman and then come back her skin popped up as a white woman and now she became black again so it's a lot spoiler warning uh if you haven't watched the show <laughs> go go watch it do not eat while you watch it because you might get sick I never uh, even I watch that show. And don't watch it at the night. Gore, of the gore. That's I thing. close my eyes because I'm a child and cover my ears. So I'm like, no, I don't like the sound of it. Yeah, it's it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I watched um, a newer show. What is it? Power Ghost. You Ooh. do? Now, are you watching it just because you were loyal to the power? Or is it something like, okay, I'm going to give them a shot because whatever. I want to see if they can redeem themselves for the last three seasons. More so the second one. And it's the thing about like TV right now, everything got pushed back. Yeah. So like usually like I watch a lot of stuff on primetime TV like Grey's Anatomy, Station mm-hmm. 19 and they all come on in like the second or third week of September. So everything got pushed back to like late October, more so November. So there's really nothing else to watch. And I like to watch stuff with black people on it. So mm-hmm. I'm going to try it out, even if it's not that good. I'm going to see a couple episodes because it's not a lot of shows that just have us Correct. on there. It's, Correct. You know, we're very limited with that. So I'm going to watch it regardless. It's actually pretty. It's good. I mean, it's, it's decent. I think I definitely yeah. need to get rid of the teacher storyline. It, it makes no sense and it doesn't add any value to the show. I'm, I, it's not <sighs> even, but the teacher's program, we got to get rid of that. 
when I see them, I'm like, All right, I can go to the bathroom now because I don't need to watch this part. Because anyway. I think it would be actually cool if they um, branched out and had a story just about Mary J. Blige's family. Hey, you never know. We got the mid-season finale, so That's maybe so interesting. Maybe, maybe they'll watch this and say, you know what? Sydney had a good idea. Let's uh, hire her to write. I mean, I hope so because I think that. <laughs> Though, I mean, like, Ghost Family was cool, but yeah. they, you know, Tariq and the other, those other kids, like, they grew up, <laughs> Raina and that other Raina, Baby girl. The baby, yeah. They grew up, like, having that money. They grew up not yeah. having to deal with, like, the hood stuff. So I mm-hmm. like this family is more connected to, like, the neighborhood and more connected to the streets versus, like, Ghost Family wasn't as much. Yeah. So you I had, think that's a cool way to they like hood rich and I like to see that. You like to see hood rich? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's black excellence. It's you know, like some it's form. Providing for their families. Correct. You had mentioned Grey's Anatomy, which is the creator of Shonda Rhimes. Um, I know that Shonda Rhimes, Avery Duvernay, Issa Rae, they inspire you. And why? Uh, so, it, Issa Rae, I have been following Issa Rae since YouTube, since Aqua Black Girl. Like, I think I hopped on the first season of Aqua Black Girl. I've been watching it literally from the beginning. One of my friends was like, this is a really funny little quirky show called Aqua Black Girl. So I started watching. And then a few seasons later, for real, I think started to produce mm-hmm. her uh, YouTube. And I was like, Okay, like that's a pretty big name to attach on and more people were starting to know her. And then I look up, she's on HBO. Like that's the goal. Like made HBO, it. You know, if I could ever like create a show and have it on HBO, like that would be, you know, that, I mean, that's definitely a goal of mine. Like I would have reached what I want to do with my life if I had a yeah. show on HBO. HBO is my favorite channel. It has like the most... Uh, they have a lot of shows I like on there. They just have like that cinematic value to all of their shows. And they all have, they're just so good. They are. They, they are. are really good. So Shonda Rhimes, I, I mean, I've been following her for a while too. I just like women in general who mm-hmm. are, you know, creating their own content and, you know, creating actually like good quality content at that, you know, and be, and I love that they're being recognized for it. You know, I love that when they are filming, they're getting more women directors involved also in their projects, more black people in general, you know, on television so that we can see them, you mm-hmm. know, turn on the TV and then they're getting more black writers. So like the content, you know, makes sense. Like it. Yeah. Uh, insecure resonates with us so I know it resonates with me and it resonates with not only black women but black people period because yeah. those are stories that they're telling right right and I think that's important but speaking of women creating content I've seen your work on revolt uh I've seen you work with Spike Lee before um when did you decide to pick up a camera and start to create content oh uh, so in high school, I did um, Gallery 37. Mm. That's like an art program. It's like after school and you go down to the building. I think it's like on Randolph. Mm-hmm. Right off down. Michigan Avenue. Right. So I did that my senior year because I wanted to always go to one of those like away film camps that mm-hmm. I saw the white kids do on TV, but I could never find anything. And then if I did find of course so far away from where I lived, I had a car, but I mean, it wasn't getting, you know, mm-hmm. that far. Um, so I found Gallery 37, so I did video production for the full year, and then I did graphic design for After School Matters, and then one semester, and then over the summer, I did, um, what is it, like t- TV production or something like that. Okay. But then once I went to school, I st- to U of I, my goal was still to be an entertainment lawyer. That's what I originally wanted to do. I didn't. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I think I just didn't. Well, I always wanted to go to law. You know, I argue a lot. No. And <laughs> I thought that that was just like the best 
case scenario. Like that was the best bet. I could make the most money in mm-hmm. the entertainment law. This is just like the path that I want to go into. So that was my focus, like all of college. So then when I got out of college, um, I started applying to different law schools. I didn't do good on LZ. Whatever you could do, whatever the score was, I don't even remember because it's so far mm-hmm. behind me, but whatever the score was, it was terrible. Like I didn't do, do well on the LSAT. So I kept applying to schools and I wasn't, I wasn't getting in. So I said, okay, I'm going to take a year off and I'm going to retake the LSAT. So I think I retook the LSAT and then applied again. And then did, I did get in again. Did you pass this last time? I mean, I, it's not like pass or fail. You just did you score high enough? ACT, no. I scored. <laughs> I didn't score well either time I took that LSAT. I'm trying to remember if it was like that. But then I said, okay, I'm going to, I made the choice to say I'm going to fall back from law because after a while, I was like, what am I even fighting for? Like, do I really want to do this? And it wasn't more, it wasn't really the rejection letters. It was the, well, it was the rejection letters, but at the same time, you know, is this something I want to keep fighting for? Is this something I want to keep pushing for? Mm-hmm. for and I kind of fell out of love with it. And I started getting to, into more film and picking up, you know, looking at film differently, looking at television differently, saying maybe this is what I should go for. So I applied to a school called Loyola, they had a a program called Digital Storytelling or something. And then I applied to Roosevelt who had integrated marketing program, just in case. Then Mm -hmm. I applied to New School, which is in New York for media management. So I got into all three. So I was like, well, maybe this is where I should be focused (laughs) because I did get into all these schools. I actually did put effort into them. And it just seems like something that you know, that I want to do more. So then I ended up going to the new school in New York for media management to get my master's in that. And in the program, you have to take um, video courses, editing and audio courses. So that's when I initially picked up the camera and started shooting. And around when I went out there, it was around like 2014. It was after Trayvon Martin, I think Eric mm-hmm. Gardner. So it was a lot of protests in New York, like New York was protesting super heavy. And then I said, okay. So I started, you know, learning more about, um, you know, the system. So mm-hmm. I started, you know, my camera saying like, okay, let me go out there and start shooting what I see. So I started going to all these protests and I was shooting all of this footage and I was making different, like uh, maybe like 10, 12 minute videos about what I was seeing. So I was like, this is what I want to do. You know, mm-hmm. I actually want to be the person behind the camera and I want to produce. So then I got sick again. My cancer came back in 2015 when I was turning. I was 26. Turning well, no. Mm, I was turning 26. So No. I was turning 25. So what year is that? Uh, 2014. Yeah, still 2014. So mm-hmm. I found out maybe that October when I went out to... Um, New York that January. So I found out maybe like that October, stayed a little while longer. Mm. And then I came back to Chicago in December. So then I was working with somebody and they we were doing like little short videos, but it just didn't work out with me and that person. So I said, okay, I think it's time that I just buy my own camera, mm-hmm. my own content. I think at first I was kind of afraid to do it myself. So I was like, let me just hire somebody to shoot it and I can direct them and you know produce it and say like, this is what I want. But since it didn't work out that way, I just got my own camera and started shooting. So I started shooting my friend Mello. Everybody hey Mello. He's a DJ. And I started going to his events. And mm-hmm. then I started to do videos for him to put up on Instagram. And that's how people started following me, knowing me for my work. And then they started hiring me for events. So then that's kind of how I fell into shooting some parties and that sort of like fast paced um, branding content. That was a, a yeah. That was good. I forgot all about to say because I was so into what you were saying. Um, so, how has creating content opened up different doors for you? Um, I would say I've met a lot of different people in uh, the not as much in the TV and film world. I did PA a little mm-hmm. bit, but not that much, just because 
I always had chemo. So mm. chemo was the one thing that always set me back from doing anything full time or anything that was more than, you know, like two or three months. Mm. After that, something would pop up and they're like, oh, it's time for chemo again. So I'm like, okay. But it did yeah. open doors. I met, I've definitely met a lot of people, met a lot of people in music, performers, different artists, different visual artists, um, the other people that want to do documentary work. I do a lot of interview style work too. So I met a lot of people, well, you know, with that and yeah. got some different jobs. Yeah. Through that, it definitely, networking is definitely important in that field. So I met some pretty cool people. I'm, I mentioned it earlier. I saw a picture that you took with Spike Lee. Was that for, uh, what was the movie he did here? You remember the movie that? Chirac. Yeah, Chirac. That How picture was... wasn't from it. I did PA on Chirac, uh -huh. but not long or anything. Mm -hmm. But that was for like some music video that was attached to Chirac, I think. Okay. It was like a music video that they did in a church. Mm -hmm. that, I don't know if it was like a soundtrack you know, something to deal with the soundtrack or something like that, but I can't even remember. I would just okay. have to believe he was in the church. And I yeah. The oh, so I, th I thought you worked with him, like you were able to see him in his element. Just a little, I mean. Oh, was it enough to soak up anything? Mm, I, I don't know. I mean, I think he's just very serious, very in tune with his work. Like he's, you know, sit down and let's... Mm -hmm. Shots done, sort of guy. He's not playing around at all. Well, speaking about another heavy hitter, um, rest in peace to John Singleton. You mm -hmm. did some interviews with him. Uh, were you able to talk to him from without the interview? Like you just had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him? Uh, not so much, but he was super nice during the interview. I did the interview with Portia uh, King, mm -hmm. who like moderates a bunch of things, and mm -hmm. it was. It was some pretty good interviews. I mean, he definitely dropped some dimes. That's one of my favorite shows, Snowfall. So when Snowfall first came out, yeah, I don't even know. I think Portia knew somebody that knew somebody, and we got invited to the first premiere. And I didn't know what to expect because I barely saw a lot of promo for it, but it seemed like something that I would like to see because I like stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I saw it, and I was like, oh, snap. Like, this is, this is really good. So then the next time we went, we was able to interview him. We interviewed him, yeah, maybe once or twice. Yeah. Do you remember any of the gems he uh, laid on you? <sighs> um, it was something specific that he said. But okay. I cannot remember what it was, but it was a good one. But it had to do with the time period of crack um, in the 80s. It was something okay. related to that. But it was, I mean... He's a really good, you know. Yeah, he's 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 still dope. I still watch Snowfall, and I can't wait till they drop this next season. No, and I was happy that they were able to still like continue the show, even mm -hmm. though he wasn't there, because the show is still good. Correct. You know, he had you can tell he had his foot in it, mm -hmm. just in general, just because like how rich like the content is. So what's next with you on the content side? who I'm working on doing more concept videos, just more things that are just like concept based that have more of a story mm -hmm. to it, less of the events, you know, less of maybe even promotional things, but promotional things that include concepts. And I do also want to direct and I want to start writing more. You know, I do write sometimes on my off time, but they say if you can't really say you're a writer if you don't write every day, and I don't write every day at all. So I would say I'm just I'm working on that, <laughs> but I'm definitely working on some content just because I do want to get uh, in the door with uh, television. When did uh, have you started the script for the Black Kill Bill? The Black Kill No. No, I'm not even, I don't even know where to start. Kill Bill is my favorite movie of all time, Kill Bill. But no, I don't know if I'm cool enough. I mean, you right there with Quentin, you know? Oh, you I don't know if I'm got cool. The eye. I have been doing some, some crazy stuff in the hood. <laughs> like Black Kill Bill meets Black people meets 
the hood. The, hey. You know, the guy with the sword who live in the house in Compton somewhere. Like, we got Lupe showing off his samurai skills. So he does he he uses swords? Yeah. On his Instagram, he's been practicing for like the last two, three years. And he's getting good at it. So okay. Lupe, holler at Sydney. I would use him and I would use uh Rizzo. Is that his name? That's that's yes, that's his name. I would use him. I used yeah. to watch, I watched Wu Tang series and that was pretty good. So I okay. learned more about Rizza then and he's really into like that whole action, samurai sword, mm -hmm. you know, those sort of movies. I, I got like. you. I yeah. got you. It's you didn't have you know, give me some you actually just gave me an idea. It's up here now. And I'm about to write it down as soon as we get off. <laughs> Just can I can I be in it? Can sure. I work with you? Can I do something? Sure. Oh, okay, y'all heard it. She's gonna put me in her uh, Kill Bill movie. Um, mm, mm, behind the scenes. But I want to be in it. Okay. I, I could work nunchucks or hold a light or. You could work at the front desk. <laughs> this is another episode of Homegrown the series. <laughs> uh, thank if you study uh, the nunchucks, it would be so tweaked out. You've been watching another episode of Homegrown the Series. I don't um, know nunchucks. We don't know. We have to put you to training and everything. I mean, you will have the budget. So anyway, anyway. Okay. And you were actually honored at the Color Me Social ceremony this in 2019. How did it feel getting that phone call to know that you were being celebrated? It was actually pretty cool because I shot, I didn't actually shoot any of those, but I work with that organization all the time. And mm -hmm. then I you shot something for them a couple of times and then I edited the video from the, so I've never been to the gala before, mm -hmm. but I have like done their pre promotional things for the gala. So I work with them closely. So it was pretty cool to get nominated for something just in general. That was like, oh. How was it? You got dressed up, had your hair all laid Yeah, you down. got to get dressed up and everything. It was, you know, black tie. Well, mm. if it was black tie, but we had to dress up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, it was pretty cool getting nominated, getting honored, and, you know, you feel appreciated. Okay. Like someone else is watching you. you okay. Know? Well, I heard that people may be listening to you soon that you oh. might have a podcast. I do. I have a podcast coming with a friend of mine, Ashley. Okay. Still in the works of getting all the kinks together, all the pre, 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 pre. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't have equipment yet or anything like that, but we're pretty excited to do it. We've been doing some research on different podcasts. And I mean, we like to talk shit. That just is what it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we like share. We want to have fun. And we think it's best if we do it on the podcast. Hey, there you go. This pandemic definitely uh, has taught people how to adapt. And you've been adapting yeah, and since we have been talking 20. about it for a while. I'm sorry. No, we have been talking about it for a while. So it was like now is a good time to correct. Actually be serious about it. Start really writing down ideas of things that we want to talk about and start, you know, getting equipment and figuring out like guests who we want to come on there and what platform we're going to use. It's a lot of different, of course, it's just a lot of different things we didn't know came with mm -hmm. starting the podcast. And I do, I mean, I listen to podcasts. I listen to The Read. I listen to well, I watch Joe Buttons mm -hmm. sometimes when I could tolerate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I was like, okay, we can do this. I think we can do this. Do you do you listen to or watch any other podcast? Oh, uh, no. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. I listen to yours. Watch oh. yours. Watch mine. I always forget that it's considered a podcast more so when you can watch it visually. Yeah, it... It's like blurred lines a little bit. Like the Joe Bun podcast, they have audio. Like Jesus and Mero have audio, but they also have a show. Joe Budden also records his podcast and they it gets, it gets uploaded to YouTube. Like mine just okay. exclusively lives on YouTube. Right. Cause I've never even uh, listened to his. I've only 
watch it. I exclusively watched it on YouTube. It's good. I yeah. mean, I don't, they're not on Spotify anymore. I think they took all the episodes down, but I, I think you like it. And he just introduced uh, another podcast with three young ladies. Similar to his show, they just talk talk what, about shit. What are their names? I forgot the young ladies' names because they just dropped the first episode this week. But I think the name of it is See What Happens Is, See What Had Happened Was, something like that. And they literally just give you the a woman's point of view about everything that's been going on from Rihanna Taylor's trial, not trial, ooh, excuse me. That's you again. Thank you, thank you. They touch on a lot of topical things. They talked about Tori and Meg, that whole situation. Um, what's going on with Breonna Taylor's case and the stupidity with any, anyway. Um, yeah. No, nah, but I, I think people will want to listen to you, will listen to you and get and enjoy it. Maybe you'll remember some of the, some of the gems that John Singleton gave you. You can give them nuts. I'm really trying to think what he said. I don't know. I it's just okay. super nice. Okay. And I was just happy to get an interview, let alone yeah. Like, yeah, get a picture, any of that. That was just like something that I thought probably wouldn't happen ever. Mm -hmm. So. Well, there we go. Um, my last question to you is if you could create your own network, your own show, be on your own platform, what would it be and how would it look? If I could create like any show, any show beyond create your own network, how would that look? How would that feel? Um, if it oh, my own network, black, very black, like it's said, black AF, mm -hmm. just because, like, why not? You know, why not? We deserve it, and sure. we need like, really good content. I would want it to be shows about us that aren't you know, the same sort of show, just like different stuff, like how Insecure is, and they follow people that are young, you know, millennials, like living their mm -hmm. life, figuring things out, or, you know, sci-fi stuff. Like I'm really into sci-fi. That's new, but I am mm -hmm. really into sci-fi. I'm mm -hmm. really into fantasy stuff. Like I like, um, what is it? Coming of age mm -hmm. thing. Like I always catch, I'm actually watching one right now. Like I, before, we were on the phone. I was watching one. It was called like American Pie, like a, the girls edition. And really? I mean, it's I mean it's not like the best or anything, but I do check out those sort of like book smart or mm -hmm. shows, just those sort of movies. But I always see them with white characters and like the black characters, like the friend or like mm -hmm. the. You know, you don't ever really see the friend in it that much. And it's really centered around that one white boy who's so cool at school. Or he's a lame and he's trying to get the girl and mm -hmm. he has a black friend, you know. But I want the black guy to be the center, <laughs> you know, the black girl to be the center of the story. I do, I really like coming of age things. And I think we don't have enough coming of age things. And I don't think we have enough um, black horror. Like we're getting there. We're getting some black horror. This is the most black horror I've ever seen. <laughs> like so, George Peele. Mm -hmm. Like I've so never you, really seen much of that. So I would want it to have, if I had my own network, I want to have everything, you know, all type of stuff. So you didn't like the Snoop Dogg vampire movie? I don't know anything about that. <laughs> oh, well, bless you, because you didn't need to watch it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Snoop Dogg is a vampire. Snoop but I want to give everybody a chance. And I like... You know, we do have certain networks that do have that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Like my mom told me about a, um, a network called Aspire and they show uh, short black films a lot. Okay. And then I know we have TV One, they show like throwback stuff. And then of course BET. So there are networks out there, but we should have more. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's important to be able to get our story out. Like you can, change the channel when you see a white person on every single channel and then we get you know four channels you know what we i get mean the, like, we oh. get the stars black yeah yeah, yeah. Um, like we get you could go on netflix now because everybody is 
woke and it'll say like black <laughs> this is like oh you know you know on the yeah category strong black leads and yeah well i love strong black lead but i know that they're really trying and they want to put more things on there and they put girlfriends yeah. on there and they really have black people working because i follow a few but i just mean like it's like a category that's not strong black lead it just says black or something and it's just like all of these black little shows and i'm like okay i guess we're getting somewhere you know? yeah i think uh, we're getting somewhere but we still in my opinion we have just kind of a long way to go yeah. it's, you know we take what we can take and we're really proud of those things and we stand behind and then we like we finally got a show but i'm mm -hmm. like that's just one show like yes i'm happy we have insecure and we got power and snowfall know, Snowfall and Queen yeah. of the Queen Sugar and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Those are some of my favorites. But even Lovecraft, you know. But we, there's still more for us to have. There are so many Black content creators. So if I did have my own network, it would really be reaching out to different people that are Black that are content, you know, doing their stuff on YouTube or doing stuff on Instagram or, you know, in those short uh, film festivals and you know, watching that stuff. And it would be important for me to actually really do my research. I wouldn't want um, to just get Hollywood and like, oh, I got my own network. I'm just going to mm -hmm. get her and her because that's what they do. No, I want to see, at least see what everybody has. Yeah. You know, I feel like we deserve more than just a few channels and deserve just more than, you know, right now, how many black lead television shows can you name on hand? We got Snowfall, uh, maybe eight, maybe eight, maybe Compared eight. To, if you type in how many t running television shows are on TV right now, it's like 200. Yeah, Yo. that's not, yeah, yeah, wow. When you think about it, like, it's so many different shows out here. And wow. When we think what? about it, it's not a lot of ones with black leads and we have some that are diverse but and you know we applaud diversity but mm -hmm. it should already be diverse you know what i mean like we applaud Correct. who are diversifying their content but it should already we shouldn't have to apply when people do it or apply when people give us like a pat on the back or a nomination like these are things that we're supposed to already have like zendaya just was like the second black woman who was who won um uh, the emmy. actress Mm -hmm. or Emmy the second that's that doesn't even you know that doesn't matter girlfriends sense. didn't get anything girlfriends I don't believe they won anything girlfriends is that's crazy yeah fact. Well, don't even talk so I would want to have all sort of content if I had a network and then my own show you know there you go well we just hey here everybody gets a everybody, everybody gets, gets a, a little piece of the pie if I get some money <laughs> <laughs> if I get okay. money, we gonna look like the black HBO. Also, it's gonna be quality content. Can you bring UPN back? Oh, that would be so good. <laughs> so, they have like half and half and everything on it. Yeah, they had that Tay Dick show. I think Kevin Hall, or whatever. I'm like, that was a great show, and they canceled it. Yeah, I, I want to get back to that. You know, like back and, when we were younger, we had famous Jet Jackson. Famous, famous Jet Jackson. Mm -hmm. What did he do? Was he like a? What did he do again? He was like a, spy a detective? or a detective. He did some. I think he was in the Navy or something like that. Something oh. like that. But I mean, if you're looking for a strong male lead, of course. I got it. I, I'm looking. I'm looking all around. I'm just trying to figure <laughs> it out. Okay. Okay. Wherever they are, whoever they are. Okay. Okay. Well, Sydney, thank you so much for sharing these stories. Um, thank you that you continue to keep going. Um, you are inspiring so many people, people you know, and a lot of people you may not know. So continue to stay strong, continue to create that good content and write every day. Because I want, I want a young girl to be like, Sydney Kennedy inspires me. She's, she's who I look up to. And I know that's going to happen one day for you, for sure. Thank you. I appreciate it. I received that.
There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, that's been another episode of Homegrown, the series. I'm your host. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe.